All right, good morning. This is Sunday School, Acts chapter number 17, please. Acts chapter 17, please, in verse number 26. Of course, you guys have heard a lot of crazy things happening in the news in the past couple weeks, and uh, especially this past week. And a lot of this is a good opportunity to discuss identity even more. Uh, I think America struggles with this idea of, of determining what their identity is, and they look more on the outward as opposed to the inward. And that inward, that as Paul says here, he says in verse 26, and hath made of one blood all nations of men. See, when you look at the, the life, what is the life of an individual? Is it their outward? Is it their body? No. What, what is the life? It's the blood, right? It's that inward. What is, you know, between every individual, they all have share a common trait, which is their blood. All mankind also have inside of them and possess a soul, right? And so that soul that they have, the identity that people try to find, it, they're always looking for it in an outward manner. And unfortunately, what we're finding is it's a distraction away uh, from, uh, from the gospel. Uh, on, on the couple of blogs that I post recently, people always said, uh, preach the gospel. This is their new fa favorite s uh, statement to use. Preach the gospel and only when necessary use words. And I kind of looked at that like, what? That's their new slogan. That's where that's where that's the majority. That was actually the top rated comment this morning on the on the blog and the last actually last week. Everybody was saying that you know preach the gospel when it, when necessary use words. So what that basically means is that your actions should speak louder than words, and that you shouldn't have to say things. And and of course you know if you even try to promote the role of preaching or promote the role of doctrine or sound doctrine that comes from the scripture. Uh, that is met with opposition. So today what I want to talk about is I do want to talk about how God sees you, how God sees the world. And when he looks down, he doesn't go, oh, um, you're black, you're white, you're Hispanic, you're Chinese. You're... No, no, he sees only two things. And those two things are either, number one, he sees his son. A great thing. Because, as you all know, this is my son in whom I am well pleased, right? Hear ye him. When you look at Jesus Christ, he says, I always do the will of the Father. Now, is that something that you wish you could do as a believer? Sure, sure you do. Now, can you get close to doing that the more you study and, 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 and actually not just study, but actively put into practice through the, the, the mortification of the flesh, the, the doctrine that you've learned? Yes. So study in and of itself doesn't, doesn't just bring about the, the action, right? I think a lot of times we, we, we look at that study and go, yeah, it's important to study this. Absolutely, no doubt. Study, study, study. You, sh you should study your Bible. But what comes out of that is, I think, the best way to use it is mortify the deeds of the body. I think that's the best way to say it, right? So when Paul says, you know, what fruit had you aware of in those things you're now ashamed? It's a viewpoint of, okay, what does your flesh pr produce and what does, it, what does it do and where are, you, where are you actually going on your Christian life, right? So your eternal life is now, your Christian life has begun the moment in time you place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And so God now sees you either as being in his son, just, just I mean, as he sees his son, that is how he sees you, right? And it, I think that we forget that. I think we forget that, that God sees you as his son, Right? Or he sees you in the, he doesn't see you like, well, you're doing okay today. You're doing like a three out of 10. So when I take care of Noah and I have to watch him, there are some days I go, what a precious little, and I call him the angel baby, right? I'm like, he's being such a little angel baby, being so good. And then there's other days where I'm like, I want to Hulk Hogan smash his face against the ground. He is being so naughty. He's being so disrespectful. No, you poopy head. No, no, you but you, you know, whatever. I'm like, stop using those words. Stop. No, I haven't, you know, just, just in this mode, right? And so as the father, I go, you know, okay, time for discipline, time to make sure he listens, time, whatever it is. I train, train up a child in the way he should go. Hopefully when he is old, he won't depart from it, right? Hopefully. Hopefully. <laughs> Hopefully. Depends, how, depends on if he, how much flesh he decides to, to interject in there. But so what God does is people think, well, well, I really messed up in my flesh today. Okay, God understands that. Let me, let me make that really clear. And he's not looking for your flesh to please him. It's really hard for people to separate that in their minds. They can't get it that when, they, when God looks down, he doesn't go, man, that, your flesh is just getting in the way all the time. Well, yeah, he knows that. He, he, that's, he's the one that told you about that, right? He's the one that told you that, that the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh, right? He's the one that told you, but, but most people don't know that, right? 
If I went around and I asked people if they knew about the old man versus the new man, they would have no clue. I shared with the guy that I was talking about earlier before, I was sharing with him about that. I was telling him about the old man and the new man, and he was really like, I could tell he was like, all right, all right, like, go, go yeah, tell me more, what, what now? Like, he wanted to hear more about the old man. He was like, I, I'm, I'm interested because I know a lot about the old man. I'm real familiar with him, but this new man thing you're talking about, this, this concept I'm not really getting. So it's trying to teach him that spiritual mindset philosophy that, that the Bible teaches. It is a philosophy. It is a way of life. It is life. So when you look at how God sees you, he's not going like, well, you messed up today. Time for some condemnation, right? That, that's, that's not how it works. But that's how, the world, that's how the world thinks in terms of Christianity. Now, the other side of it, the flip side of it, either God sees you justified and in his son, or he sees you as what? He sees you as how the bulk and the majority of the world stands, and that is they stand what? Condemned, right? And, and we're going to hear a lot today in the next weeks and in the months to come that we should not judge anybody. A girl came to our Bible study and said, uh, we shouldn't judge anybody. That's what she said this past week on Wednesday. And I said, well, what do you mean? I said, do you watch the news? She goes, yeah. I said, have you made any judgments about the things that have happened? Make, make any decisions? Did you decide what was right and what was wrong? Well, well, you know, and she kind of took it back. She goes, well, I just don't think it's our place to do that. I said, whose place is it to do it then? Well, 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 well it, it's God's place. I said, well, God's committed all judgment to the son. She looks at me and she goes, so I said, it's the son's, it's the son's place. It's, it's Jesus Christ's place. I said, what do you do with the verse that says, Paul says, he that is spiritual judge with all things. What do you do with that verse? How do you, how do you handle that? She never heard the verse before, right? She didn't, she didn't even know it. I said, so I said the, the thing is, it sounds good to say we don't judge anybody, but you do. You do make judgments. And I told her that, and when I said this to her, I think it really clicked. I said, inherent and implied in the gospel message is the judgment of all mankind. You can't get around it. it it's, it's, it's whether or not you want to make it explicit, right? Inherent and implied in the gospel. So anytime you bring the gospel, what do you have to talk about? Christ died for our sin. Real quiet, you want to talk about it. The more you magnify the sin, though, as we've said, it increases the, 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 the efficacy. It allows you to really experience, if you want to experience something, why don't you experience the grace of God on the greatest level? And as I've been saying, my new favorite phrase the last, like, four weeks has been, isn't it very comforting to know that God knows and knew how sinful you were and are? So that when he says Christ died for the ungodly, he, he, de he defined ungodly and he put your face there. And he goes, that's you. That's, that's you. And to me, I go, okay, that's, that's, a, that's assuring. Why is it assuring? Because on a performance-based system that you always keep doing, you, you always try to keep putting yourself in that, even though you know you're not supposed to. You, you like For some reason, your flesh just keeps getting in the way because God tells you it's going to. If you just listen to him, he tells you that's what your flesh is going to do. So when you realize and ultimately come to a conclusion, when you, when you really believe that they that are in the flesh cannot please God, I mean, that's liberation. It's complete freedom. They that are in the flesh cannot please God. And you know what's even more, I think, a better way to say that is that God accepteth no man's what? Person. If you look over with me at, uh, at Galatians chapter number 2 and verse number 6, this is, this is the mentality that you should have regarding people. I will tell you that for the most part, there's a verse in Jude we're going to look at in just a second, but people will take a position that they have, or people will admire a position and, and they do it for advantage. How can I use it to my benefit? So when you go to the book of Galatians in chapter number 2, in verse number 6, you read the following. Read verse 5. He says, To whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you, but of these who seem to be somewhat... And just to give you an explanation of what that means, those who seem, that means their outward appearance, what it looked like to them, how, how they perceive these individuals to be. They seem to be somewhat. And now notice, the, notice that parenthesis that he says there. Whatsoever they were, it maketh no matter to who? To me. And then why? Every day of your life, your mindset should be in lockstep with God, right? 
That's ultimately to, to, to live by the will of God is to be in lockstep in the thinking of God. So when Paul says that it makes no difference to me, it maketh no matter to me. Not just a little matter. Well, it maketh a little bit because, you know, that guy, he is an apostle. I mean, that guy, his name is Peter, right? He says, it maketh no difference or no matter to me. God, what? Accepteth no man's person. And that is the really, in my opinion, at the end of the day, when it comes to the fairness of the judgment of God, right, who will render to every man according to his works, what is the flesh going to produce at the end of the day? Nothing. It, it, it produces the condemnation. So when you look at, like, the great white throne judgment, and, and it says, well, yeah, God's fair, who will render every man according to his works. Well, yeah, he's fair. And, and what they think in their mind is this. Get this. Get this. They think at the end of the day, God's going to render to every man according to the works, and they're going to get like, okay, $1 for that, $2 for that, oh, $5 for that one, ooh, that was a real good one, $10 for that one, as opposed to condemnation, more condemnation, here's a little more condemnation, here's some more condemnation, here's a whole heap of condemnation for that issue that you did there, right? They're thinking about it that, that it's going to be a positive, when in fact when he renders to every man according to their deeds or more according to their works, it's actually a ginormous negative. Wake up call? I think so. But as I've said the last couple weeks too, people are going to act surprised, but they know it. They, they know that. In, in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 6, he says, God accepteth no man's person. And so then, of course, the million dollar question people come back to is, well, but, 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 but what about Israel? You know, they love to bring that up. They love to say that kind of stuff. Well, well yeah, didn't you, didn't you, did you, have you read Romans yet? Did you, did you see how, what he talks about, how it's a hard issue? How it's always been a heart issue. See, what I think the, 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 the problem becomes is they, they don't see what respecting man's persons really does. It's, it's the distraction. And so to this past week, we have, we've had a, you know, another shooting of, of another individual. It's unfortunate. Yes, it's, it's very sad. Uh, that individual, if you read his rap sheet, it's quite long. He's done a lot of very heinous, horrible things. Does that mean he deserves to die? No. Right? Is he condemned by the law? Sure. Yes. When you look at those issues, the Christians will come out of the woodwork. I see them right now. I see all my friends coming out. And they're pr promoting a, a social gospel that does not preach the gospel. There's no gospel in it. It's, again, the false narrative that we just need to love. And if we love, we can fix the world. You can't fix it. it, it it's not possible. And if you're on Facebook, I'm sure you've probably seen thousands of these posts. And I see very close friends of mine making posts all the time. I don't engage them because it's not worth it. There's no benefit in that. There's no fruit. So I would encourage you, just don't bother. But they will make long, tedious very detailed posts about how they believe that they can fix this world. When again, what is that? It's simply a, simply a distraction. If we can just restore civil rights and, 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 and make all men equal. Well, well, you can make all men equal. While you're in the book of, of Galatians, turn to Galatians chapter number uh, 3. And read verse number 26. He says, for ye are all the children of God. How? How can you become a child of God? Now, we're going to read a verse in just a second that Paul says that, don't you know that we're the offspring of God in Acts chapter 17? Remember that verse? He says it. But he says, ye are all the children of God. How? By faith in Christ Jesus. Hold your place there and turn back to Acts 17 so we can read these two verses together. I'll read these couple verses and then we'll jump back to Galatians 3. He says, verse 26, And hath made of one blood all nations of men, for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed in the bounds of their habitation, that they should seek the Lord, if, happily, they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, 
as certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. What do you mean? How are you the offspring of God? You've come from God. To create, have an offspring means that you have, you, have to, you have to create life. And I tell you, every time, when some, if somebody can sit in the delivery room and experience the birth of a child and then walk away and go, oh yeah, that's, that's just his evolution. Um, you got screws loose in your head. You got, you got absolute screws loose in your head. And if you, can, if you can experience that and not cry, you also have screws loose in your head. I'm not a crying person. You might get me to cry once a year. And I cried at the delivery of both of my children. And it was weird because it was an overcoming of like, wow, this is an emotional, and I'm not an emotional person. This is a pretty intense moment of, for me, it was not as much the life being brought in. I was like, this is as close in the dispensation of the grace of God as you can get to seeing a miracle. Okay? You want to see a miracle? Go watch the delivery of a child. That's a miracle. I loved it. I was like, I mean, now my wife and I are like, should we have, should we have more? Should we have three? And then I just, as I'm, as I'm, I'm, take, I'm walking down the driveway this morning, and I, I, I see one of my buddies driving by, and he stops, and he, he waves at me. And I'm like, what's up? And he's like, oh, just, you know, driving the car, looking for bunny rabbits. And I said, what? He's like, yeah, on Sunday mornings, I just got to get out of the house. I throw one of the kids in the car, and I say, we're going to go look for bunny rabbits. He says, really, I just drink coffee and listen to music. I'm like, awesome. I said, how's that going? He's like, dude, let me tell you, three, it's out of this world. He's got a three-year-old, a two-year-old, and a one-year-old. So he's like, you know, he's nonstop. I said, how is it? He's like, he's like, honestly, dude, it's really bad. He's like, I'm, I'm dying. He's like, I'm dying right now. Like, I, I'm just, I can't even, I can't even stay afloat. He's like, because what happens is one will wake up. I put the other one to bed. The other one wakes up. And, you know, I'm like, I'm like a zombie. He's like, I live off of coffee. I'm like, wow. Okay. So he said, basically, he said to me, so if you're thinking about three, he's like, doing a little cut your throat sign like yeah yeah you don't you don't want to do that but that that to me he he's he, he he him and i have had that discussion he says i'm not a super emotional person either but when i watched the delivery of my child i was just like this is this is unreal this is so just it's awesome but at the same time you go we didn't do this right we didn't really do this because we wouldn't even know how to do this this came from god so when he says that you're the offspring of God, this is something that, that God allowed the life to be formed. God creates the method in the manner of which procreation happens. And, and, and he creates, you know, as, as really a, a, a offspring of God. You are made, Adam and Eve were made in the image of God, correct? And then the fallen image, of course, is still an image when, when Jesus Christ was made man. Even when he's in, in his glorified state, he still, has, he still has the appearance of man, correct? Right? So just because Adam's fallen doesn't mean that we're not made in the image of God in the sense that we are not perfect, but Christ was. When you think about these verses in the offspring of God, verse three, 26 of chapter 3 of Galatians says, For you're all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. See, the offspring is, is a different than a child, right? See, this, this offspring that he's saying is like you're, you came from God. You, you, are, you, you are created by God. That's why in, in chapter 17 he says there, he says in, in verse uh, tw tw 29, for then as much as we are the offspring of God, what is he trying to prove the point of? We ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone graven by art or man's devices. In other words, he's saying, if you're the offspring of God, did you come from the little graven image that you made? This little, this little stone or gold or silver? Is that where you came from? No, where did you come from? Well, you, you came from God. You, you came. I, I said this before to Noah because we were looking at a video, and he goes, where was I? <laughs> and I'm like, oh, man, this is a tough question. This is like five years ago. And I'm like, I, you weren't born yet. <laughs> and he goes, well, where was I? And I'm like, you weren't born yet. And he goes, where was I? Right? He doesn't understand what it, what, he, what it means. He's like, I don't understand. I'm like, he didn't exist yet. <laughs> he doesn't get it, right? But, but to think about how, how, the, how, how God sees the, 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 the preciousness of children, I think all the more, wow, our, our society is incredibly perverse in, in their view of children, right? They, they, want to, they don't care about a, child, a child's life. Uh, they they want they'd rather take away the repercussions of the procreation and say oh we can just 
live as we please and, and live again really that Epicurean lifestyle of highly, you know, highly sensual and just, hey, let's live our life. And hey, guess what now? We have all these things. We can't get pregnant. We can't get STDs. We can just live a life however we want with no responsibilities. And hey, what? If we make a mistake, who cares? We can kill it anyways. It's pretty sad. Pretty sad. Going back here to, to uh, uh, Galatians chapter 3 and verse 26, when he says you're the children of God, in order to become a child of God, it requires, as it says here, by faith. So, so to be able to say, God is my father, what is the necessary element? Faith. And the focus is on who? Christ Jesus. As we know that there is one mediator between God and man, the man who? Christ Jesus. See, when it says the man Christ Jesus, it's saying that because what he did as a man was that start of that reconciliation process. The man Christ Jesus. You do remember, he came in the flesh. And see, there were a lot of people who were denying that Jesus Christ came in the flesh. And if you read those verses, as we kind of discussed a little bit, I think, in in Bible study, about that that concept of the Antichrist. We were talking about the Antichrist, the beast, the false prophet, and uh, and Wednesday night Bible study. Because I said, what do you guys want to talk about? We We finished up the repentance study and, you know, they had nobody, nobody had any questions for me. I'm like, well, do you want to you want to talk about what I'm studying right now? And they're like, sure. I'm like, might be boring. <laughs> so we went through the the beast, the false prophet, uh, you know, and, and and the the you know some things that people are just like, what? Right? I, I think I think I maybe had one person staying with me that everybody else was kind of like, what do we get ourselves into? <laughs> right? Uh, and so, you know, go, going back to the faith in Christ Jesus, the the, the concepts of the antichrist, as you'll see throughout. Uh, the text, especially in John, he says there's many antichrists, and what do they deny? They deny that Jesus Christ, you know, ever came in the flesh, you know, and they say, oh, I'm the Christ, I'm the Christ, I'm the Christ. So to, to be a child of God by faith in Christ Jesus, it requires you to believe that Jesus is that, that, that Christ, he is that son of God, he came and he died for the sins of the world. He says, for as many of you have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. And as we know that that baptism there is a spiritual sense in which God the Father, by faith of the operation of God, baptizes you. And he puts you into Christ, you've put on Christ. So when you put on Christ, what is it? What I think about, remember when Adam and Eve had sinned, and what does God do? He makes a covering for them, right? He put, makes, the, clo- the, makes the, clo- the, the cloak to cover them, and that cloak is kind of the picture of, of what Christ can do. And so he says there, there is neither, notice this now, when he says, is if you, after you've put on Christ, the covering of Christ does what? And number one, it takes away your your disposition prior which is a disposition of condemnation and it puts you into a position now as he says look once you've put on christ he says there's neither jew nor greek there's neither bond nor free but wait 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 you mean there's no more slaves anymore wait 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 you're saying i can't be a greek anymore but i love my greek heritage i want to go to the sponge docks in tarpon springs i'm kidding but you know what i mean like they, is that really what's happening well in a spiritual sense it is yes in a carnal sense, do people still retain that? Yes, of course you do. You still retain that heritage or whatever it could be. He says, bond nor free. What does Paul say about the bond? He says, care not for it. What do you mean? Well, if you're a slave, who cares? You're the Lord's what? So you can do whatever you want in Christ Jesus. So going on even further, he says, there is also neither, and, and this, is a, this is probably a controversial verse for this day and age, right? There's neither male nor female. He's not looking down and going, oh, man, yeah, we could really use... No, no, there is neither male nor female. For your what? He says, you're thinking about it in the wrong way. You're thinking about it as me, 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 which is how you've been living your life. You need to think about it as being Christ, 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 and being a unified body of Christ. So you don't, you don't take that to the extreme of going to ecumenicalism where you're like, well, yeah, we're all parts. I, met with, I talked with a guy. I, say, I have these little discussions with people. You know, it, it may be five minutes, it may be 30 minutes, but if you have those discussions throughout the week, I will tell you, number one, if you're having trouble studying, go have some, talk, go have some discussions with people. That'll make you go back and study. Because he was hitting me up and he says, well, I mean, aren't we really just all one in Christ Jesus? That's what he's trying to tell me. And I said, well, yeah, what do you mean by that? Well, don't you think that the Catholics are one in Christ Jesus? And I said, there's a difference between saying you believe something and believing something, Right? And there's a big difference saying, oh, yeah, I believe that. Sure, they can say that. Catholics are always agreeable that, yes, I believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sins. What else do you believe? Well, I also believe that 
you need to pray the rosaries and you need to count beads. And, you know, so they're going to have other things that they're going to do that are going to, you know, again, negate the justification element. But when you do these, 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 this picture of, of one in Christ Jesus, it's, it's again, removing back away and going, look, God respecteth no man's person. He's not looking for you. He's looking for the body of Christ to operate as the body of Christ, with Christ being the head. Where is Christ today in the church? Uh, he's been decapitated. Okay? The body of Christ, unfortunately, has taken a guillotine and taken it and chopped off the head and just let it sit because they don't, they don't even know what the head is supposed to do. They don't get it. And when you read those verses in Ephesians chapter 4, where he says, till we all come. You remember that verse? Ephesians chapter 4 and verse number 13, <clears throat> where he says, till we all come in the unity of the what? Of the faith. See, what does the faith start to do? Well, the faith is what puts you as a child of God. So you have to have the faith, which is, you know, Paul defines what the faith is. That's, that's his gospel. He says, till we all come in the unity of the faith. And then he also says, that's how you, you know, you, you become a child of God. But what is the knowledge of the Son of God, which then does that maturing process? And this is what I had also discussed with this guy who I was fishing with the other day. And I said, yeah, it's God's will that all be saved and then come to the knowledge of the truth. And I think that was a little foreign to him, too. He was like, what do you mean by the knowledge of the truth? I said, well, don't you think? Can you, I said, do you believe that every church in America preaches the same exact gospel? I said, if every church in America preached the same exact gospel and they taught and preached the same exact thing, we wouldn't have to have 3,000 different denominations, right? We, we would only have one. And I said, and he goes, well, isn't that exclusive? I said, well, what do you mean by exclusive? Well, do you, do you think it's necessary to have multiple denominations? I said, well, no. Denominations are created because of your flesh. I said, because it appeals to your flesh a little bit more. You go, well, I like this church here because, you know, if I was in the inner city of downtown, you know, Atlanta, I probably don't want to go to the church with all the black people because I'm going to be uncomfortable. Well, that's what your flesh says. When Christ Jesus, he says, there is neither male or female, bond or free, if you agree, great. So what are you looking at? Oh, you're looking at men's flesh. You're judging based upon the outward and not based upon the inward. That is how you end racism. You want to end racism? Get everybody in the body of Christ and start teaching them good doctrine. That's really it. You're not going to create. You don't try to don't try to change the minds of unbelievers. Okay, it's just not going to happen. When you try to go in and tell them, well, look, you just got to love, love, love. That's not that's not going to fix the issue. In order to under, even understand love, you have to know what love is, which is what? Christ died for our sins. I, mean, I feel like a broken record sometimes, but it's necessary. I mean, there's only so much you can preach about. And, and, and if you get sick of hearing that Christ died for your sins, better find a new church, better find a new assembly to come to, because that's what we're going to preach about on a regular basis. So for the individuals and my friends, who I'm sure will listen to this sermon, don't be deceived in trying to think that you can change the world. Okay? Don't think that we're going to do it. We can do it. We can make it better. We can change the people's minds. We can make this happen. You can't. They're like, well, that's a very negative outlook you have. I said, well, no, it's called believing the word of God. If evil men and seducers will wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived, then that's what's going to happen. I believe it. I don't, I don't think that it's going to get any better. And unfortunately, you see it too much where this new era of social gospel is going to become so prevalent that people aren't even going to preach the gospel, mostly because they don't even know what the gospel is. When you get down to it, I want you to turn to the book of Jude, and chapter number six, 1, one verse 16, I want you to read this passage with me here. Here's the reason why the majority of individuals respect persons. He says, these are murmurers. Uh, actually, go back up to um, verse four, 15. This, he says, in the Lord, the Lord cometh with ten thousand of his saints to execute judgment upon all, all to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds, which they have ungodly committed, of all the, their hard speeches, which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lusts, and their mouths speaketh great swelling words. 
having what? Men's persons in admiration because of advantage. The reason why most people speak words, swelling words, words that will, will make people feel good, as, as, as the legal term is, just, just puffery, right? Just mere puffery. What is that? Men's persons in admiration because of advantage. They're using it to promote whatever they want to promote. Typically, some type of false doctrine. Turn with me to Galatians chapter 1 and verse number 10. When Paul preaches the gospel and he says, Look, if, I, if any man preach any other gospel than that which you have received, you know, look, this is, this is the only gospel message. Even if I come back to you and I tell you another gospel message because I somehow get, you know, uh, confused, don't believe it. Okay? The one that I gave you right now is the truth. If I, an angel from heaven, if anybody else come back and tell you anything else, it's going to be false. So now in verse number 10, he says, For do I now persuade men or God what does he mean for I do I now persuade men how is he going to persuade men what's he trying to do see when Paul when Paul preaches the gospel message sure he wants to persuade them but he doesn't want to do it in any form that would do what that would that would be persuading by by trying just to please them and in other words he says or do I seek to please men in the gospel message that I'm hearing about preach the gospel and when only necessary, use words, I roll my eyes and go, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Because how are they going to hear without a preacher? I'm going to bring this, you're going to get this all full circle in just two minutes. It's going to come all full circle and you'll go, ah, oh, ding, 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 I get it. Okay, just, just bear with me. It's going to come, I promise, these verses are going to come full circle in just a second. I keep saying it, but listen, if they say pre preach the gospel when only necessary, use words, well, isn't that like the best thing Satan could possibly tell him to do? Just keep your mouth shut. Just, just don't talk. I mean, Paul says in Romans chapter 10, faith cometh by your actions, right? No, it says faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Now, when you read this next part, he says, for if I yet please men, notice this, if your agenda is to please men, what does he say? I should not be the servant of Christ. If your agenda is to make people like you, is to make people go, we love this church. Have you seen our Google reviews, our Yelp reviews? Oh, they're awesome. Our church is the best. Well, chances are you're trying to please the men. If you give away iPads at your church, I will tell you that you're seeking to please men. True statement. If you give away gift cards to Amazon for people who will Twitter out or tweet out, they love your church with a hashtag, we love your church, you're seeking to please men. Those are real examples that actually happen on a regular basis. See, when you try to seek to please men, you shouldn't be the servant of Christ because, as we said in the very beginning, God accepted no man's person. And our mind should be in lockstep with God's, as he says in Galatians chapter number 2. Whatever these guys were, what's he say again? I'm going to read it. Whatsoever they were, it maketh no matter to me. And that's how you should look at it. Did you hear about the black guy? What color is he? I mean, whatever. I mean, doesn't matter. God doesn't see him as black. I don't see him as black. Gospel can reach any single person. Black, white, yellow, green, purple. I don't, don't matter to me. Whatever you want to do, you can believe the gospel. Now here's where it comes to, the, comes, to a, comes to a head. Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. And what Paul does here is he, is he explains that the gospel is for everyone. Because he commands all men everywhere to repent. All men won't just some miraculous way go, Oh, you know what? I should believe the gospel. Oh, you know what I should do? I should just, I should just repent and, and believe that God is not myself. That God is not what I thought he is. 
No, because if you read how this works here, these are very highly intellectual individuals, the Epicureans, the Stoics, the philosophers. All they wanted to do was learn, 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 hear about more stuff. And when Paul says here in verse number 26, and hath made one of blood, one blood all nations of men for to dwell on the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation, that they should seek the Lord. Notice that phrase, that they should seek the Lord. Well, what does that go contrary to in your mind? Well, nobody does that. Who, who seeks the Lord? Well, that they should. Just because you should do something doesn't mean that they do it. No. In Romans chapter number 3, Paul says that there's none that seeketh after God. Well, they think they're going to seek after God. They're looking for something. And honestly, those are the best people. The people who are looking for something. All of these people, when Paul saw it, the whole city is wholly giving un unto idolatry. His heart is what? His whole city, the whole city was wholly given to idolatry. His spirit was stirred in him. But he knew that, look, you know, there, there's an opportunity here to present to them the ignorant ignorance that they have about who they ignorantly worship, that he can then declare Jesus Christ unto them. So how do you reconcile the verse, the verse here where it says, There is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. They are gone out of the way, they are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. How do we reconcile that with these verses here in verse 27? That they should seek the Lord, if happily. What does that word mean? It's kind of like that word peradventure. It basically. It just might just, you might just stumble on it and you find it, right? If, I'm going to give a real modern thing. It's like the Pokemon Go. It's the hottest thing going right now. I'm telling you, it's super fun. My wife is so, it's dangerous. My wife is so mad at me about it. I started playing it because my friend was like, you need to check it out. And I was like, all right, I haven't played Pokemon since I was a child. So I go out there and start hitting the button. I was like, oh, this is kind of fun. This is kind of cool. So, but all the Pokestops are churches. I don't know if you noticed that. A lot of the little Pokestops, you guys aren't playing this game. To the younger generation listening, the Pokestops are churches. And so they go around and you spin the little Pokestop and pick up, you know, items and things like that but uh, where I was going with that I really don't even know but uh, the, whole, the whole city given wholly unto idolatry uh, I gotta get my refresh now because I'm thinking about Pokemon it's not it's not good uh, back back to Romans chapter 3 how do we reconcile these verses that there's none that understand there's none that seeketh after God they are all going out of the way together become profitable all of those things how do you, how is this word happily used well it's like the peradventure word you know you remember, remember when he says that peradventure it's just like, yeah, if by chance, I mean, it's like, dude, it, it just maybe happened. You might just stumble upon it, right? There's, it's just perhaps, really. I don't, it's, it's, it's maybe. And so when, when the happily happens, it happens because of a witness, right? As we talked about the last couple weeks, in Acts chapter number 13 and verse, uh, 14 and verse number 17, Paul says, read, read verse number 15, when he says, look, sirs, we are men of like passions with you, right? It's a way he produces a, a, not a pandering and not a pleasing of men. He just wants to make some, some common ground. He goes, look, I get it. We're on like ground regarding our passions of worship, our passions for wanting to please God. Verse 15, we are also men of like passions with you and preach unto you that you should turn from these vanities unto the living God, which made heaven and earth and the sea and all things that are therein, who in time past suffered all nations to walk in their own ways Nevertheless, notice this, nevertheless, this is how they should, should seek after God. He left, it's not like he didn't leave them without a witness. He says it was still always there. Number one way it was always there was through the nation of Israel. But when they looked at the nation of Israel, guess what? What is blaspheme? The word of God. By who? By Israel's actions. They look at it and go, oh my goodness, Israel, look at these guys. How do you mess it up? God tells you exactly what to do, and you don't do it. It's like a Seinfeld episode. He told you what to do, but you didn't do it. Why didn't you do it? I don't know. We just, we're just, you know, Israelites. That's what we do. So he says, In two times past, suffered all nations to walk in their own ways. Suffered means what? He didn't suffer through and go, Oh, I'm suffering through it. He allowed, right? It was occurring. He suffered all nations to walk in their own ways. It's the same thing he's getting ready to say here in Acts chapter 17, where it, it, the best way, I'm just going to quote it because it makes it, makes it better, where he says, and the times of this ignorance, God winked at, right? It's the same thing. 
This, this ignorance, now you, there's no excuse at this point. You should, you could have found it. He says here, nevertheless, he left himself without witness. He left not himself without witness in that he did good and gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts and food and gladness. And with these sayings, scarce restrained they the people that they had not done sacrifice unto them. Now, going on to Acts 17 and, and bringing this to a close here. Two minutes. How you reconcile that no one seeks after God in Romans chapter 3, verse 9, is that it's, it's, it's very much in opposition to your flesh to seek after God. Your flesh wants to find God, but it doesn't want to find a God that's going to do what? That's going to condemn him, right? Well, why would I want a God that's going to condemn me? I don't like that God. I like the guy that says, oh, I can go out and live a nice sensual lifestyle and do whatever I want to do and just eat, drink, and marry, marry, because tomorrow I die and there's no repercussions for any of my actions. There's no personal responsibility. Love that God. That's the God I want to sign up for. And as I showed you last week, the 500 plus gods that were on that list of papers, they make gods up for everything. What kind of God do you want to make up? You can make up a God for that. Go for it. You want to have the Pokemon God? Go for it. You know, whatever you want to do. You can make up whatever God fits you. And that's the new postmodern thought that's not po new at all that has been around forever. So, again, the condemnation of the world, what does it do? It equals out all men. Think about that. The condemnation of the world equals out all men. All men stand before God in the same manner, shape, and form. God's not going to go, oh, well, you know, because the, your incarceration rate as a black is going to be held against you. No, it doesn't matter to him. He doesn't go, oh, yeah, that's it. We're going to, no, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. He's going to do what? Render to every man justly. Because as you read in these verses here, because he hath the point of the day in which he will judge the world in what? In righteousness, which you should be happy about that he's going to judge the world in righteousness. He didn't leave. It's, when he says, Paul says here in Acts chapter 17, in verse number 27, that they should seek the Lord, if happily they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. He's not far from every one of us because he left himself not without witness, right? Those verses we just read, the verses in Romans chapter number 1. The invisible things of him through the creation of the world are clearly seen. Even his eternal God had empowered so there without what? There without excuse. So again, what's, what's, in, what's the best witness? People. Paul, Saul of Tarsus, is a great witness. Why? Because he's got real life experience that he can testify to and provide great evidence. I mean, 1 Corinthians 4 and Romans chapter 10, we'll look there for just a second. Romans 10, verse number 14, he says, How then shall they call on him whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a what? Without a preacher. What is the preacher going to do? The preacher, see, what's funny is the preachers have always been there. It's just a very small group of people that want to continue to preach good, clean, sound doctrine, and the rest of the world goes, you know, the way of the world. And so when God looks down, as we said at the very beginning, he goes, you either got individuals who are in Christ, or you have individuals who are sitting there condemned. You know, the results of Paul's sermon, and we'll stop with this, the results of, the results of Paul's sermon, we'll pick up just a little bit more next week, but the results of Paul's sermon, to me, are comforting. After all that, does he get everybody going, ha! Huh! we believe we believe oh yes no very few people believed his message see from the world's view they would think well that's weak few converts like that paul step aside let us show you how we can we can fill this place right how would you do it put a rainbow flag outside of your church you'll get nine thousand people coming to your church you think I'm kidding. It's true. Put it out there. See how many people you'll get. Pander. Pander to the people. And you'll get them to come. Do as it says in Jude. So you would, you, by admiration, what do you want to do? You respect those persons so you can take advantage of them. Because that's really what you're doing. And what are, who's really taking advantage of them? See, so that they don't get is they don't realize that they're actually doing the work of the devil. They're actually doing the ministry of Satan. When in fact they think they're doing when, when they think they're doing the ministry of, of God. See, those that are steeped in intellectualism, like those there in Acts chapter 17, they're the hardest people to reach. 
the most difficult people. Why? They see no benefit in it. The question they're going to ask you is, how does this help me? And they're so nearsighted that the only thing they can think about is how does it help me in my flesh, right? Well, we go, well you're thinking about it from just your, like, your 70 years. I was just fishing with a guy yesterday. He's 72 years old. He's got a pacemaker. Said he was out on the boat. Pacemaker stopped working. I said, oh, that's sketchy. He says, yeah, I felt like an 8% difference. So that's a very random number. He's a, do he's a doctor, so you would think he probably knew. Yeah, I felt an 8% difference. I said, 8%, huh? He goes, yeah. Felt my heart changing a little bit. I said, that's weird. I said, what'd you do? He goes, got real mad at the doctor, drove the boat home, called him up and said, I, my, my pacemaker stopped. I told you to change the battery. So he told me, he says, I just retired this year. I said, why? He goes, because all my friends got cancer. I said, what did that mean? He says, made me think that my time's short. So, you know, he's a tough one to deal with because you got guys that have been 72 years old. He's scoring 10. It's real hard to tell somebody to stop believing what they're believing. It's real hard. But when the rubber meets the road, hopefully, you know, these individuals will uh, come around and you hope they do it before they die because that's their only opportunity. So, all right, let's close in our prayer. Dear Father,